So this concept about imaging being important, and especially for the life sciences, is quantified here. And it just points out that imagery is not only gotten from instruments like MRI images, it's also got, as we'll see later on, from light sources. And so we need to somehow set up an activity which um, does the best possible job for um, doing you know, processing these images. And as there's so many of these images, maybe some pipeline and some back-end resource, which is either in a cloud or a supercomputer, is needed to be a bioimaging resource. Um, so that's the idea here. By in this case here, that they're proposing we use high performance computing, but I think they could do the same thing with appropriate clouds. And one needs to obviously not only get the data into the cloud or the supercomputer, manage the storage, um, run the right algorithms to enhance the images and extract segments and objects from the images, and find either human or other ways of extracting features. And there's our set of um, Image processing libraries mentioned here, which I'm not personally familiar with. Image J, Omoro, and Volro. Now we come to one of the genomics examples. It comes from NIST. They have a, actually I'm, I'm probably in the scale of genomics, so not a huge data set, but it's a very typical of the issues. Which DNA sequences produce um, hundreds or maybe th thousands of gigabytes of uh, data per day. And that volume has increased much faster than most. Laura showed that slide in the uh, introduction. And proteomics also provides equally large amounts of data. And NIST is 40 terabytes, and they're petabytes at NIH. And actually, probably most labs nowadays have pe can or do have petabytes of data from their relatively cheap $100,000 uh, gene sequencer that you can buy commercially. There's a lot of software, most of it is open source. And um, some of it requires actually large memory. It's a well-known challenging problem to process uh, sequence data. And to uh, basically take all these little fragments the sequencer produces and aligns them. And so this particular project is very typical of many, many projects. It's just one of lots of such projects. And this one project has 40 terabytes. Here we have a rather more global discussion of um, genomics. We have the metagenomics case, where you're looking at multiple genomes, such as that extracted from environmental studies. Take pond water samples across the, across the world and compare ponds or something like that. Um, and that has even larger data sets. You need to find what's, which genes are in a particular sample. Try to find out their functions, look at the pathways imply, characterize the similarity or dissimilarity between these samples we take from different environments. This is sometimes called environmental genomics. And give, then, we can, then we try to work out why these particular changes happened and to relate it to environmental uh, features. And then we need to look at particular, we're obviously going to have these huge data samples. We'll look at subsamples of particular issues. So they're building, uh, this, this use case is building a web based analysis system. And there's a lot of these standard tools which are mentioned here. And um, they, they will be accessible through the web. Um, currently, they use relational databases, but and they have 50 terabytes, this particular group of data. Um, but um, when relational databases are already finding this hard. Uh, the claim is no SQL doesn't work so well. I imagine there will be people who might disagree with that and suggest that with properly optimized solutions, no SQL is able to do this. And of course, um, this points out real time interactive use, so that's the streaming aspect of this problem. And uh, also, as the software is open source, it tends to be somewhat flaky and not clear, easy, easy to deploy robustly. 
Here's an example of um, effectively the earlier uh, electronic medical records would apply to diabetes and also identifying a particular feature. Namely, if you um, put together all the world's data relevant to diabetes, which is the actual patient records, the information on the disease, the information on the drugs, the information on the drug companies, information on the hospitals. Then you get a rather complicated uh, set of heterogeneous data, which uh, you, uh, this group proposes to convert to RDF. And that actually gives uh, this graph-based structure, which we mentioned as being important. Um, so if they look at this particular case, they point out that the patient record might have 100 uh, areas where there'll be a control per category, and then 1,000, so actually discrete entries, and maybe 1,000 continuous values. Uh, most of these values have a timestamp, and uh, this makes it actually the processing not really a straightforward SQL command, but actually a relatively complicated um, um, piece of mathematics to be able to process this continuous time series data. And you have to you know, calculate the numerical derivatives on numerical rate of changes, compare them between patients. And so that actually makes um, some sort of NoSQL approach with a rather generic uh, user-based, uh, sorry, uh, generic um, processing built on top of it. Uh, by, by, I meant to say custom-built uh, software that does the processing, calculates all the derivatives, and then finds its derived values to mix a comparison between the various uh, data sets. And then, but we still have to process this graph and uh, this is with, this work is with Mayo, and they have to work with an existing data warehouse, which needs to be converted from a traditional form into RDF. RDF is, um, comes from the uh, semantic web community and is a very useful way of uh, representing uh, metadata. So. Here's another example from a researcher, faculty member at Indiana University uh, called Statistical Relational Artificial Intelligence. And it's basically taking actually records, a typical relational database records, and applying machine language and other types of, well, here I call ego global optimization approaches to it. Ego always implies machine uh, language in my classification scheme. Um, this, his particular work, which his research is done on hundreds of gigabytes of data at the moment, but with a large cohort of data, patients that could get to hundreds of hundreds of terabytes to a petabyte of data. And he points out that in some sense you can have too much data, and machine learning algorithms can actually be confused by too much data and uh, extrapolate uh, small coincidences into important deductions that need to be worried about. Um, so this is pointing out that the machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, research behind healthcare is a very vital area. And the ECC, these researchers need to worry about paralyzing their analyses. And so that's non-trivial to do, because they're not always trained in that area.